Hi, readers. Welcome to Books Connect Us from Penguin Random House. This is a podcast about staying connected with each other and the stories and authors who inspire us. Judd Apatow is one of the most important comic minds of his generation. He directed the films The 40-Year-Old Virgin, Knocked Up, and Trainwreck. His producing credits include Superbad, Bridesmaids, Freaks and Geeks, and The Ben Stiller Show. He's the author of the interview collections Sick in the Head and Sicker in the Head, in which Apatow sits down with comedy legends such as David Letterman, Whoopi Goldberg, and Will Ferrell, as well as new stars such as John Mulaney, Bowen Yang, Amber Ruffin, Pete Davidson, and others. Let's join Pat Stango for a conversation with Judd Apatow that covers his career, his books, and his reflections on life devoted to comedy. Judd Apatow, thank you so much for joining us on uh, Books Connect Us. Congratulations on the new book. Thank you very much. Um, So you've written now uh, two interview collections for Penguin Random House, Sick in the Head a few years ago and Sicker in the Head. So if you want to just tell listeners what readers could expect out of Sick in the Head and Sicker in the Head, why they should be excited to pick both of those up. Well, I think uh, they're interesting books because, you know, they're interviews with mainly comedians, but there's also just creative people I interview. So there's Sasha Baron Cohen and... Nathan Fielder and Amber Ruffin and people like that, but also I interview interview like Jeff Tweedy from Wilco and and Gail King, and their discussions about comedy and life. They're about creativity. They're about the reasons why we decide to be creative. And generally, we get into just discussions about life and what we've been through and what led to us wanting to be funny or feeling the need to be funny. So there's almost a self help aspect to the book as well. Mm-hmm. So this started, uh, you've kind of famously started doing interviews with comedians that you were fans of when you were a teenager, um, did those radio interviews, kept doing them over the years, and that made up the first collection, Sick in the Head. And for this one, a mistake, you know, let me know if I'm wrong, but for Sicker in the Head, for the new book, these were all done with the intention of being in the book. Did you find that the way you went into these conversations changed, obviously from when you were a kid who was a fan, but did, did, did you find yourself wanting to talk about things differently than you did in those original set of interviews? Well, when I first did the interviews was in 1983, 1984. And back then I just wanted to talk to comedians just to know, you know, how do you do it? I wanted to touch that world. I, you know, it's like this thing and you want to get inside of it, both to meet the people and to try to understand if it's something that you can do. I wanted to do it. Mm-hmm. And back then there weren't podcasts. There wasn't the, the internet. There weren't long interviews with Jerry Seinfeld in 1983. So I always joke that in my head it was like I was trying to invent the podcast mm-hmm. because I wanted an hour-long interview with all of these comedians I admired. There was no place to learn a lot about them. Mm -hmm. So I did about 45 or 50 interviews in high school. Most of them I didn't even air. I just did it for me. Right. And then when I did the first book, I interviewed a bunch of people in addition to the old interviews like Chris Rock and Jon Stewart. For the new one, I did most of it during the pandemic. So it led to a much more intimate interview. People were at home reviewing their lives and I think people were much more vulnerable and open than in the previous book because of the state that they were in. Uh, did it? Did you then, in that context, did it feel like you said more like therapy than anything? Like you're you're talking to these people in the middle of this, you know, kind of terrible time, and you're um, everyone's almost looking for something to do. Oh, absolutely. Well, I knew everyone would be available because. Everyone was stuck at home and no one was able to work. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, maybe I should take some big swings to get some people that maybe normally would be harder to get, mainly because they're busy. So I asked Lin-Manuel Miranda to do it, which is very exciting because I'm a giant fan of his work. And then David Letterman said yes. Mm -hmm. As a kid from Long Island, it was a dream that, you know, I would be able to talk to Letterman, ask him questions and ask him how he does it. But also, you know, it was a very reflective interview 
about what it took to be that person mm -hmm. and to to be in that position and what it did to his life and to his mind to be under so much pressure for so many decades. So we talked about comedy, but we also talked about depression and the intensity of working at that level. And he, you know, he, he talked about the fact that he, he felt like he missed a lot of it. He, he was so, so obsessed that in a way it, it just flew by him. Right. And it, it was, really interesting to talk to him about what it's like, you know, to be, you know, our Johnny Carson. Right. Right. Yeah. Do you, do you think that someone like Letterman or, you know, you, you talk to people at different stages of their careers, you know, it's, it's the Amy Schumers who are starting out and the people like Albert Brooks or David Letterman at, at points where they're looking back. And do you, do you think someone like a David Letterman or Albert Brooks, are they able to understand who they are the way we look at them and say, man, that's David Letterman. Does he understand what he meant? Or does it all, you know, is it hard to understand that when it's your life that you're living? I don't think that they, that most people are comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the interview, I said to David Letterman, uh, you know, I want to thank you because you're the reason why so many of us got into comedy. And for so many of us, you supported us and gave us big breaks. And I just want to thank you for that because you mean so much to all of us. And he just said something like, yeah, there'd be no comedy without me. It, you know, it was hard for him right. to accept my love. But I think on some level he understands, but I think for all of us that do this work, mm -hmm. you just feel like yourself and everything that other people put on you it is hard to process. Right. Right. Cause I would guess you're, you're in that similar spot where someone will come to you and, you know, the Ben Stiller show made me want to change my life. And then to you, I'm guessing it's a thing that you did. That was the craziest part of your career. And, and, you know, it, it, it doesn't, you know, tell me, is it the same? It's a job. Yeah. It's just a job that you're trying not to screw up. Right. And then it's wonderful that it means so much to people, whether it's that it made them laugh or it made them laugh at a hard time in their life or it inspired them to be creative. But for the person making something, they're trying to get something out and express it. And then it suddenly takes on a different life for people. Mm -hmm. How has your relationship to comedy or comedy fandom changed over the years and that you you know, started as a teenager who was a fan, getting all these interviews, and now you're doing a similar thing, but these are with your contemporaries, people you've worked with. You're also, you know how the, the cheese is made. Are you still a comedy fan in the way that you were 30, 40 years ago? I think I am, and that is, you know, what my whole world and business is about, which is, I just try to think, who would I like to see in a TV show? Who would I like to see in a movie? Mm -hmm. So if I meet Kamel Nanjiani while doing a podcast, you know, I, I might just think, if there was a movie with Kamel, I'd go. And then my job is to go, hey, Kamel, you got any ideas? And then if he does, maybe I can help him and Emily work on it and develop it. But it comes from the fan place. Mm -hmm. Like we have a movie coming out uh, in the fall with Billy Eichner. And it just starts out with, I'm a fan of Billy's. Mm -hmm. And there's no Billy movie. And there may not be one if, if I don't push hard to get him to write something. He wrote something with Nick Stoller, which Nick directed, a, a gay romantic comedy, which we were, we're very excited about. It's a big studio picture. Uh, so something like this hasn't really been done before. And it all comes from the fact that he just makes me laugh really hard. Yeah, it, it is. It is a great thing that you, you know, have been working with a lot of the younger comedians the last few years, getting new projects made. And what do you how have you seen comedy change in the types of comedy that people want to do and people want to see? In that, again, you've worked with everyone. You've talked to so many people in these books from the 70s all the way through today. What are some of the big shifts, if anything, that you've seen in 
the types of, of work that comedians want to do versus what they would have wanted to do in the 70s or 80s? Well, back in the old days, everyone wanted their Roseanne or Home Improvement. That was the goal. People would do The Tonight Show, and then hopefully they would get a sitcom, and those sitcoms were in front of live studio audiences. At some point, things changed to single camera comedy, and there was more of that, and then it became streaming. But it's, it's, changed, it's changing now because everything about movie theaters is confused. People aren't sure how many people want to go to movie theaters. Mm -hmm. What movies do people not want to see now that they are comfortable watching everything at home? Can you pull people into a movie theater to see a certain kind of drama or a comedy? Or are they always going to wait till it's free mm -hmm. on a streamer? And I don't think that's really been determined at this point. We just did a screening of Billy Eichner's movie. And... We had 300 people in the theater. It was the first time since 2019 that I'd had that experience. And the crowd seemed ecstatic to be together, sharing that type of romantic story and a big laugh comedy. So I feel like people really want it, but it is uh, incumbent on the studios and all of the different networks to make them. I mean, they have to spend the money to develop them and they have to value it for those types of movies to be made. And then I, I'm glad there's more diversity in comedies. This isn't like the, you know, the early 80s where you'd get your occasional Chevy Chase movie. Mm -hmm. You know, they are taking more chances. Hopefully they'll take a lot more. But, you know, some of what we try to do is try to figure out what an underserved demographic or community might be and see if we could use whatever weight we have to push some things through. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. In these books, like you said, it's it's about comedy, but it's also you end up just talking about life in general and the hardships of life and, and everything. What are some lessons, whether it's in your work or just helping you in your day to day life that you've pulled through some of these conversations that you've had over the years? I generally probably go back to childhood trauma. Mm -hmm how it influences your need to be creative and to express yourself or to be seen in some way and to succeed. Sometimes people do that for their parents or sometimes because they felt mistreated, but usually there's some sort of wound that makes you sensitive to other people's lives and their feelings and struggles and, and your own. And then later in life, you try to heal it, you, you, know, you use it for your creativity. But at some point you think, well, I'd like to be less neurotic. I'd mm -hmm. like to be less hypervigilant. I'd like to be someone who doesn't have a, a racing neurotic mind. And so a lot of the conversations I have with people is about that journey. How do, how do we mature? And obviously that's the theme of all of my work is screwed up people trying to be a little bit better, mm -hmm. trying to make their relationships work or their friendships work. And, you know, other people have different themes that run through what they do. But that's the thing that generally interests me, how screwed up we are, how it messes up our lives and the things we do to attempt to heal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting how many comedy comedian origin stories are how either self-hating or un, you know, not confident everyone was. But then at the same time, you're getting into something where you also think a room full of people want to hear what I have to say on stage and I could command a it it, it it just always seems like such a contrast of like the most self-hating person who is like, I'm also gonna be the center of attention. It, it makes no sense whatsoever because Everyone who does stand up is so concerned about being liked, but concerned to the point where they will put themselves in front of hundreds of people and let them judge them. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like if you can beat that crowd, you're beating some obstacle that you have. Like for me, I have a voice in my head that says, shut up. No one wants to hear anything from you. So to get on stage and do stand up is a way of telling that voice it's wrong and to to like myself and have some self-esteem. But you have nights where the crowd hates your guts uh -huh. uh, in this journey to deal with your insecurities. And that's why 
people always laugh when they hear, oh, that musician or that comedian is actually very shy. But some people are so shy that they have to do this mm -hmm. to to deal with it. Have you have you been doing stand up again since uh you know, I, it's weird to say since the pandemic as if it's yes. over, but you know what I mean? Like, ha have you done it in the last year, I guess? I've done it a little bit. I I got a little thrown because I was talking about my life and stand up before the pandemic. And then when the pandemic hit, I thought, does anyone really care about mundane things mm -hmm. that have happened to me? And the truth is that they do, but I can't seem to find it interesting <laughs> mm -hmm. that there's this gigantic thing happening and the world is so chaotic and... You know, am I going to do, you know, funny jokes about things I can't remember? It, it it hasn't felt right, but I'm hosting the Directors Guild Awards in March. So I've been doing more stand-up to prepare this monologue for that, which is almost like a corporate gig. You do uh -huh. all director jokes. Right, right. And it's really fun. But I'm hoping that sparks me back into it a little bit. Right, right. You 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 got your 10 minutes on Jane Campion and then you take that on oh, the road. Oh, yes. The, the amount of Jane Campion jokes <laughs> that I have. And you could only do it in one room yeah. instead of Jane Campion. <laughs> Let's talk about the bane of everyone's existence, social media. So, you know, so, something that's, that's sort of a phenomenon since Twitter is that everyone's a comedian or at least everyone's <laughs> yeah. trying to create comedy. And... How does that affect being someone whose, you know, whole life and job is to create comedy? Do you ever feel like you're not competing, but but in some ways competing with just everyone on the planet is it <laughs> think they're doing the same thing? Well, it is the Andy Warhol comment, you know, come to life. But it's not that everyone will be famous for 15 minutes it's that everyone thinks they have a TV show for the rest of their lives. Mm hmm. I mean, people are broadcasting. They're creating content. Even, even just somebody that has no interest in it, the way they'll put up a photo or a little funny video of their family, it's all content. And you are competing with all of it. But, and, and some of it is great. That's the weird part. Like, there are right. people who just make little funny videos who are hysterical. Mm -hmm. And for me, I just think, well, I've always wanted to do movies that were the quality of movies by people like James Brooks. Mm -hmm. And that is an unattainable bar mm -hmm. for me and almost everybody. But that's the bar I'm going for. Mm -hmm. So if I think about that, then I don't feel like I'm competing with a billion other humans because very few people are trying to do that. Right, right. No one's going to tweet <laughs> broadcast news. There's a lot of people that can record music in their house, but there's very few Mozarts. You know, right. people still aren't as good as the Beatles. So right. I, I'm trying to, to you know, make content that's deep and is uh, something that will stick in your craw for a long time. And I hope that there's some significance to it. And I enjoy all kinds of comedy. I, I love all of it. But... For instance, there's thousands of comedians now, but still no one's really better than George Carlin and Richard Pryor. Mm -hmm. I don't care how many people join the fray. Right. Uh, uh, and maybe a couple of people get close, but it doesn't matter how many there are. The people who are great, there's usually still only like 10 or 20. Right, right. And I think that's true of, of most things. Right. So it's just you feel like, all right, I'll just aim for that. And at least there's a there's a goal there. I'll fail against the greatest of all right. time. That's, you know, that's that's what I'm going for, to be badly judged against the greats. Um, so since, uh, you know, this is a book podcast and, and you have these new books out, are there comedy books either recently or just over the years that you would point towards as stuff that, you know, really made you laugh that you want to point people towards? Because, you know, we end up talking a lot about performer comedians, TV comedians, but what what do you read that's made you laugh? Well, I think you know, one of the great books about comedy is Born Standing Up, the, the Steve Martin book. That's probably the high, the high water mark of of the genre of anything about making comedy. It was such a gift. I can't believe he wrote it. It was the thing that we wanted to know, mm -hmm. and then he wrote it, and we couldn't believe it. Comedians love it so much. It's like the Bob Dylan biography book, uh, the, the autobiography that 
he put out the first part of like he really he wrote it we wished he would write it right. and then he did so, uh i mean in terms of things that are funny that make me laugh you know i i tend to just look for humor in in anything mm-hmm. you know it could be a jonathan franzen book it could be uh you know in an, in an old book by f scott fitzgerald I, i'm 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 a sucker for anyone who finds a way to use wit and humor in their storytelling and i'm a big fan of you know autobiographies and you know people who find a way to tell their stories you know the the biographies of comedians uh you know that i like you know joe henry and his brother wrote a great book about richard pryor uh you know that I can't remember the name of it, but it's written by Joe Henry. And, uh, you know, but I I own all the old Groucho books. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got my, I've got my Saturday Night Live oral history. I'll I'll buy anything that, that, that somebody makes. I'm very excited about Bob Odenkirk's autobiography, which is coming out this spring too. I, uh, yeah, I just read it. It's, I mean, it's great. And it's, it's, it's you've read it. I, I, where I gotta get the galleys from you. (laughs) I'll, I'll send you a copy of your friend's book. (laughs) <laughs> please well i mean and speaking of uh autobiographies you did edit write the uh it's gary shandling's book so if you want to just talk to a second it's like why everyone should get that i mean i'm a, just a giant gary shandling fan it's it's you know the holy grail is is it's gary shandling show and larry sanders so uh you know you made the documentary you made this book so i guess why why is gary shandling such a important figure to you and why you think people really need to know about him well gary invent reinvented the form two times once with it's gary shandling show where he spoke to the camera and that really innovated tv and he had a lot of writers there who went on to make the simpsons and and i think he showed people that you could really stretch out what television comedy could do and then he did it again with the larry sanders show which was behind the scenes at a, a, a talk show you know gary was my mentor and when he died I, I, I went through all of his stuff with his family, and I realized that there was a documentary to be made, which is up on HBO Max, The Zen Diaries of Gary Shandling. But I found so much ephemera that I thought, oh, you could make an incredible scrapbook with it, because I found all the notes from all his jokes, the diaries of his entire life and career, and all these amazing photographs. And, and I decided to make a combination scrapbook oral history of Gary. And it, it's just got a lot of very moving material. He was into Buddhism and the Eastern thought and a lot of his diaries were him trying to get present, trying to have a sense of perspective about his life, how trying to reduce his ego and be a more loving person. So even within that book, there's a, a, a self-help element because that's my favorite kind of book. I'm mm-hmm. all about the self-help books. Mm-hmm. My, I am just surrounded by Eckhart Tolle and Michael Singer and Pima Chodron. I, I'm drowning in self-help at my are, house. If you are they in self-help books, you'd, you'd flip out. Are they working? Like, do you do you feel I'm like here. this? I'm still standing. That's <laughs> that's all I can say. I'm here. Am I getting saner? I don't know. I, I, I'm I'm. Every, Every once in a while, I think, I think I get it. I think I get it. And I, I'll find a book and go, oh, The Untethered Soul, that captures all of it. Just read that. What if you only read that book every day? Right. And, uh, and then I, I find another book. But I think the process of reading them and being thoughtful and mindful has helped me mm-hmm. through. I, mm-hmm. I, I don't know what level of sanity I'm at, but uh, it, seems, it seems to be going okay. In, in reading all these interviews you've had, is Jerry Seinfeld maybe the only one who seems perfectly content with everything? I mean, just from what I've seen of him, it seems like he doesn't have the same hangups. I think that he, he has hangups, but he has a funny sense of humor about them. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it's that he has less problems than anybody, because I'm sure he has the same amount as everybody else. But he has his own theories about mm-hmm, everything. Mm-hmm. Where I'm in, always in search of a theory. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jerry really has an ideology behind anything you can mention to him. He will instantly tell you mm-hmm. what his take on it is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I remember being at the Comedy Cellar once, and people were talking about how in a lot of comedy shows now they'll take your phone so you won't record the show. And Jerry was like, why, why would you do that? 
People want to record the show, put it on YouTube. They're just selling the tickets to my next show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like he instantly has a thought right. about it all. That doesn't mean they're all working. But, right, right. But in his head, they're, they're working for him. Right. Uh, so the last thing I want to ask you is you've now written these interview collections, edited these interview collections. You put together the uh, Gary Shandling uh, retrospective book. Do you ever have any interest in writing prose, you know, writing a novel, writing, uh, you know, because obviously you write your movies, your TV shows, but moving into that, like, do you see the, the possibilities for that as a writing outlet? Uh, it's not impossible. You, you, you know, one of the great years of my life was after my second daughter, Iris, was born. I took a, a year off and I did... I didn't do much other than read. I decided to catch up because I wasn't that interested in it as a kid. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, I should read Hemingway and Fitzgerald. And, I, you know, I, I should just sit home and get those books. And I asked people for recommendations. And then I would read their re recommendations. And on the back of the book, it, there'd be a blurb. And, I, and I'd go, oh, well, if that person's friends with that person, maybe I'll read their book. Mm -hmm. And... And it was a great year, and my career took off after that year. Mm -hmm. I felt like it just deepened my storytelling just by taking in a, a lot of fiction. I also thought at the time that I might try to write some short stories, and I didn't. But then I wrote The 40-Year-Old Virgin and Knocked Up and had a, a, a great run of feeling very clear-headed in, mm -hmm. in my writing. And now that these books are done, I am considering putting out some sort of half memoir scrapbook uh about my journey and i don't know how much of it will be just writing because i do have so much weird stuff i would like to show people uh -huh. from my career just photographs and script pages and and so i'm trying to decide right now what form it might take but i'm thinking about doing that next and maybe one day it'll turn into short stories uh, or uh a novel, mainly because I think at some point I just won't want to leave the house and talk to anyone. Right. I'll probably just get tired of seeing people and I'll be like, I'm going to disappear into my head <laughs> for a couple of years. It's a great, yeah, it's a great excuse to get out of, uh, to get out of uh, appointments is I'm and writing a novel. It'd be nice novel. not to debate things with everybody. And right, right. Screen things and get so much input, you know, to just, you know, to have a pure thought Right. Uh, it is something that seems very alluring. All right. Well, you know, let us know when that's ready here yes. at Penguin Random House. We'll, we'll be waiting. So, Judd, thanks so much for doing Books Connect Us. And of course, everyone pick up Sick in the Head, Sicker in the Head. It's Gary Shandling's book. It's They'll all be on the, you know, nearby shelves. So go get them. Uh, right, thanks thank so much. You. Thank you for listening to Books Connect Us. For more great book recommendations and information about your favorite authors, feel free to follow Penguin Random House on social media or visit penguinrandomhouse.com. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as it helps more listeners to find our show. This podcast is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. I've been Aaron Leaf. And until next time, this has been Books Connect Us.